This presentation explores how the 19th century contributed to the establishment of a consumerist society and how fashion played a role in that. Shopping became an important cultural activity for the aristocratic classes during the later years of the 18th century. By the early 1800s, there were vast emporiums selling luxury goods for genteel shoppers to patronize. During the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution created a groundswell of factory-made goods. Rising incomes and leisure time assured the wealthy middle classes could now own what only aristocrats had owned before. Soon the middle classes greatly outnumbered aristocratic patrons and most manufacturers were only too happy to make goods for a new, larger clientele. The rise of well-off middle classes caused a pushback from the luxury fashion industry. We've already looked at how the rise of couture for women and Savile Row for men created a style of fashion that was out of reach of the middle classes. Another way the wealthy pushed back was through creating more elaborate social rituals, subsequently creating the necessity to wear many different types of ensembles. To be most correct, one needed outfits to mark the life cycle changes such as reaching adulthood, getting married, or losing a spouse. Clothes changed to mark the passing of the seasons or the time of day and new outfits were created to wear for different sports or other activities. At its most extreme, a socially superior woman would need to own 10 different ways of dressing and proper accessories for each. It was necessary to own different clothing to wear in the country than the city and for different levels of formality or day wear. Add sports into the mix and a wealthy woman had to dedicate a large amount of her time to acquiring and wearing fashion. The best appointed men also owned multiple styles of clothing. Menswear suppliers relied on lists such as the one on the right listing the proper color and accessories for each style of dress. British aristocrats developed a particularly elaborate set of rules as they were threatened by the many new millionaires in England and America created by the Industrial Revolution. At minimum, a man would own six types of dress, including a sack suit, frock suit, formal wear, sports attire, and dressing for the country. Elaborate rituals grew up around life passages. We will explore the specifics for mourning in another presentation. One life passage that developed elaborate rules was the wedding. Before this era, a wedding was largely a religious affair held in a church. The typical wedding celebration may include a dance with sweets or drinks for the guests, maybe a wedding breakfast. Only aristocratic weddings were large affairs with many people wearing prescribed outfits, banquets, and extensive gift giving. In 1840, Queen Victoria married Albert, a German prince. This marriage was put forth by different relatives, of course, but it was also a love match, a rare event for royalty. This excited the romantic imaginations of everyone, and the wedding details were closely followed around the world. Victoria chose to wear white, which was not the standard color at the time as it is now. She chose it to feature lace made in Britain because that industry was struggling against European competition and needed a boost. With the fashion and popular press so excited, her dress was copied by many manufacturers, and after this, everyone wanted a white wedding just like the Queen. 
Newly rich families wanted to show their status by throwing a royal style wedding for their daughters, sparing no expense to outfit attendants and asking wedding guests to dress in formal attire. The idea of the trousseau grew into an elaborate ritual. A trousseau is the collection of items a young woman would bring to a marriage to set up her household. Before this time, a young woman collected these items through much of her youth, weaving or sewing household linens, basic underclothing and pajamas, small blankets, household goods. By the end of the 19th century, this tradition had grown into a vast store of china, glassware, silver, and all manner of household goods. These would all be collected on large tables in the bride's parents' home for guests to view. One example of a society girl's trousseau listed in the paper was worth $40,000, the equal of 70 years wages for the average working man at that time. The average working or even middle class woman still often wore their best dress to get married or had a new dress of another color made. This rhyme, published in ladies' journals, cautioned or encouraged certain colors. The worst must be married in green, ashamed to be seen. We will also see the principles of conspicuous consumption in the way individual dresses were designed. In the 1850s, there was a large fashion trend to use multiple ruffles on the skirts. The typical hem circumference from this era is 120 inches or 3.33 yards or 10 feet around. If you have three wide ruffles, as does the blue dress on the left, that would be 10 yards of additional fabric beyond what it takes to make the underskirt to sew them to. Some ruffles were decorated with border patterns. You'll notice the edge of this fabric is also scalloped. This would be very expensive fabric. One new byproduct of conspicuous consumption was the idea of changing the look of clothing to mark each season. Prior to this, Clothing was made of lighter fabrics in summer, such as linen, and heavier weight fabrics in winter, primarily wool. The new idea was to design an outfit to look like summer. Wearing white has always been a status symbol. Now we develop a whole season devoted to wearing it. Certain patterns and trims became associated with summer, such as florals and nautical patterns, as if we were all going boating. And we develop rules about not wearing white until Easter, so that everyone has to buy a new Easter outfit, or not wearing white until Memorial Day, so that everyone has to buy a new outfit. The tropical suit is introduced for men to wear lighter colors and fabrics in summer. This was inspired by the British wearing suits in India and the hot weather in the southern United States. Winter, therefore, brought darker colors and trims. Another form of conspicuous consumption is the excessive use of trims and lace. The large skirts made a particularly big canvas to fill, and some designers ran amok with expensive decorations. Lace had been made by hand and was an extraordinary expense that only aristocrats could afford. During this era, a machine was invented to create lace more affordably. It would continue to be a special event to own lace, but now many upper middle class people purchased machine made lace. The mechanism is called a bobinette machine, and by the 1840s the system was perfected enough to create an imitation of lace by using knitting, although real handmade lace isn't knitted. The cult of lace exploded, especially after Queen Victoria's wedding. 
Wealthy women continued to buy real lace from Europe as a status symbol. The fashion press started covering what kind of lace was worn by those women to fuel the desire for imitation laces. Even the average woman soon became familiar with terms like Chantilly lace. Another invention, chemical lace, in 1865, made complex patterns available to the upper middle class market. In this case, the patterns are machine embroidered onto a special backing. That backing is melted away with chemicals, leaving just the embroidery as freestanding patterns. This method of lace is still very popular today. You can tell a chemical lace by the tiny fuzzy edges left by the melting process. The middle classes could not afford entire flounces or swags of lace for their dresses, but they could afford small amounts to make caps, collars, and trim some edges. Many made their own using embroidery or crochet techniques. Fur was another luxury item that set the very wealthy apart from the middle classes. We recall the Hudson Bay Company established in Canada and the northern United States. Furs were an important element of the American economy, establishing independence as a young nation. New World furs were used as hats, coats, capes, and muffs in this period. The woman in the middle wears a fur from South America, the chinchilla, highly prized for its especially soft fur. During the early part of the 19th century, wealthy consumers had their carriages pulled up to the door of a store and the store owner or a salesperson would bring goods to them for viewing, hence the term the carriage trade. After the Great Exhibition of 1851, the idea of going into a suitably elegant store to look at goods on display became more familiar. In the next time period, the bustle era, we will see another new development in shopping as the quest for consumer goods grows even larger. Since we have entered the age of consumerism, our dog for the era has turned into a sponsor. Many dogs served in the Civil War, but Jack is perhaps the most famous. He obeyed bugle calls and was known for charging the front lines during battle. He was wounded three times, once critically. He was captured twice by the Confederates, once he escaped, and once he was swapped in a prisoner exchange for a Confederate soldier. Jack's portrait hangs in the Soldiers and Sailors Military Museum in Oakland.